Profile, Program 4, Stoneland Clydeware. The following program is a WWVU-TV color production. He's the author of two novels and more than a hundred television scripts. And with the recent opening of his first feature-length motion picture, he's also a filmmaker in every sense of the word. He's Clyde Ware, and, he's, and he was born in Clarksburg, West Virginia. But he grew up in nearby Doddridge County in a small town called West Union. Clyde, you're known primarily as a writer, at least until recently. When did you decide that you wanted to be a writer? I think, Donnell, it was, uh, I think it was always there. I, my first writing attempt was in the seventh grade, I don't know, 10 years old or something. I had finished the English workbook, which was kind of simple for me. And the teacher said, do something and shut up because I was talked a lot. And uh, <laughs> I wrote a play and directed it, starred in it, and put it on for the grade school. And uh, it was a phenomenal success. It was during World War II, it was called Stolen Blueprints, and uh, it was open to such rave notices in my little town of West Union that we put it on for the high school, and they were even impressed. So I, uh, long about that time, I, I guess that's when my decision was made. You must have had a uh, rather vivid imagination at that early age. Always, I always had some fantastic imagination. My family, though, was, uh, <laughs> I guess you've read my book, so you kind of know what my, I had a, a very flamboyant family, and uh, I, I was in this little town of West Union, and my mind was always far, far away, really, because uh, when you have a lot of problems, when things are going on that you're a kid that, uh, that you have no control over, uh, you go elsewhere. You know, you go to the movies and you like you dream, and uh, you hate to leave that movie theater when you're a kid, and. Uh, so the imagination, I suppose, came from that kind of thing. Is it possible, Clyde, to develop an imagination, to increase it, to make it more vivid? I, I imagine it's probably like any, uh, any tool or any, uh, any skill. You can develop it, and uh, because I know as a writer primarily, which I am, I see something, and it's a whole story to me immediately. I, I turn a corner and I see something or think I see something. Once I saw in New York City when I was a starving actor, I saw, uh, I turned a corner in Greenwich Village and I saw something to me looked like a window full of red Christmas balls. And a second look showed it wasn't that, it was something else, but I wrote a story called uh, The Man with the Red Christmas Balls, which was kind of a <laughs> piquant little story that never sold, but it was really a marvelous thing, just something that leaped into my head. Yes. And, uh, I, I see somebody and I have a whole story. I see an incident or I see, and I guess that's, uh, that's a, not a developed thing, but I guess it has been strengthened, you know, through all my work. How much formal writing do you, uh, training do you think is necessary for a writer? Well, that's a, I, I personally, and this is only through me, and uh, I don't think that uh, formal training really is where it's at because uh, the only, kind of uh, authority I can go to on something like that is Mark Twain apparently once was asked to lecture at a university and uh, he gruffly came on stage and said, how many of you want to be writers? And the hands went like that and he said, get out of here and write and he walked off. And uh, that's what it was for me, just getting down at a typewriter and becoming a professional because everybody has fantastic ideas and they people come up to me, I used to tell them people I was a plumber because they would come up, you ought to hear about my aunt so and so, and they do it now on, because I'm making pictures, they want me to do every story in West Virginia, every man who ever 
turned around in West Virginia and left any kind of uh, reminiscent of himself, they want me to do a picture on it. And it gets, uh, you know, I, I, people, they want to share something with yeah. you. So I understand that, and it's great, but uh, <laughs> it, it gets a little tiring at times, you know, because I, you, every writer has his own personal thing that he wants to do, and that, that's all it is. And to be a, a pro separates kind of the, uh, the men from the boys. Everybody has the ideas, but they don't do it. If I, I'd like to tell a, a brief thing about a friend of mine who had a, a Ray, his name is Ray Tenebruso, and he had a, like a seventh grade education. He came out of the streets of New York, a Hell's Angel type kid, and I met Ray in a trucking company in New York when I was working there. And Ray wanted to be a writer, and the guy could hardly speak English, you know, literally. He like had the D's and D's and D's, and Ray, I told him, you know, get out. neither one of us were selling at that time. We were both very young. I told him, get down to it, you know, do it, man. And uh, I was doing it and doing it and doing it, and finally I started selling and became a major TV writer and went on and on. And Ray was selling graves and doing everything all over the United States and getting run out of one city from another because he had a wife and four children he had to raise. And the financial problems were always there. And Ray kept writing and writing and writing and under insurmountable odds, no formal training, no literal education. And he and I communicated with letters constantly, because I love this guy, and he's now in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, I could tell through Ray's letters that he was growing as a writer. And I kept writing him and encouraging him and uh, to uh, quick dissolve into something to get the story going. Uh, Ray sold his first script about a year and a half ago. It wasn't a script, it was a story, and it wasn't on any kind of a level. It was in one of the pulp kind of magazines, sex, stag, motorcycle, blum, blum, kind of magazines, but he sold it. It was in print. In print, and he sold maybe a dozen or 14 cents then. He's banging at novels, yeah. and uh, I, I hope Ray makes it, because he's got what I think writers need. He's got guts, and he's got strength and belief, and he's a pro. He gets at it and uh, he's learned to speak English, and he always would reach for bigger words than he knew what he yeah. was talking about and use them in the wrong context. But now they're, we've been writing for years, and I, I could tell him grow, and it was really yeah. a, a pleasing thing to me. And uh, formally educated writers, I, I don't, I'm, you know, education can't hurt, as the saying goes, but uh, I don't know whether that's, that's really where it's at. Were there certain writers who influenced you more than others? I would say uh, subliminally, you know, John Steinbeck certainly, because I've read all his stuff and uh, Hemingway and uh, Faulkner very much. And uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald was always my favorite, although as in personalities, I guess we were totally different. I was, everybody always thought I was more the, you know, Steinbeck or something, but uh, Fitzgerald really appealed to me, but my writing is nothing apparently like his. And, so uh, it is subliminally. Yeah, well, I, I never consciously emulate mm -hmm. anybody, and uh, I think a writer has to form his own kind of style. How did and, you get into writing scripts for television? Uh, it, it became a cause celebre with me because I was in New York starving as an actor playwright, and to get a play on Broadway, you know, is uh, tantamount to the miracle of Fatima or something. It just, it's almost impossible. And uh, as an actor, I wasn't doing that well, except I was in acting class, and it was a lot of fun, you know, a lot of beautiful ladies and uh, a lot of excitement. And uh, so I, I saw the junk that was on television, literally, and I knew I was better than that. And so I said, I'm going to write television. And I forsook my novel writing and my playwriting, which at 23 I was hammering away at, and uh, spent like three years, I think it was, before I cracked television, but uh, submitting it, scripts to different oh, uh, yeah. agents or Sub programs, agents, producers in New York. This was that yeah. everything was done on the coast in Hollywood, and my agent, one of the biggest agents in New York, it was Ashley Steiner at that time. They said you should go to Hollywood because you're head and shoulders above every television writer going. And uh, I'd had plays under consideration for Broadway. I was close peripherally involved, and uh, so they said go to Hollywood, young man. So uh, I went to Hollywood. And they were saying how marvelous I was out there, and I couldn't get work. But ultimately, I did. And once I sold the first one, you know, a <laughs> hundred scripts went by in a few years. And uh, I was in great demand as a television writer. And uh, it, was, it was something that I, it was just a, an obstacle that I had determined to, uh, to, to mount, surmount. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did. And, and one, thing I'd li one thing I'd like to say, uh, just make a comment to you, uh, that uh, 
before I sold anything as a television writer, I was lauded to the skies by producers, agents, everybody. The day I sold my first script, I don't think anybody has said that I'm a good writer since then in, ter in terms of television. And I've had nothing but hassles. And I've, n I've never been able to figure out that, uh, that entire thing. Maybe you can give it's me It's like a the two sides then. <laughs> if you're outside looking in, right. they say it's, it's like you're showing a lot of promise. I guess. Right? I and guess. then once you're, you're there, they sort of accept you. That they expect that of you. Is that, is that the idea? That might be it. And then they, they hassle you from yes, then on. Right. From then on, it's a fight. They feel that they can, they can control you or uh, you know, demand things of you. Right. Yeah. Do you have to do certain kinds of research for these different programs? You've done programs from Man from Uncle to Albert Hitchcock right, right. to, uh, naturally, quite a few Westerns. Right. What kind of research do you do, say, for example, the Westerns? Well, I'm a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a, I'm a bug on research. I love it. I, uh, I spent one year at the university here in Morgantown, and I studied, I went into journalism. It was going to be my major, and uh, I, uh, I just didn't, uh, it didn't register with me somehow in terms of what I wanted for my future. So I switched to geology because I have a consuming interest in anything, really. I really have a wide variety of interests. And I thought, well, I'll be an archaeologist, and then you know, I'll write and so forth. But I only had the luxury of one year in school. And uh, I, in Westerns, I did a lot of research. And uh, I have the ability, I think, to project myself backward into any Era and it's an uh, imagination again, isn't well, it? Well, really, and it's uh, historically, I'm very, I'm very into that because I think we depict our our national heroes and uh, everything in, from the past as woodenized characters. It's really terrible to see George Washington the way they. I did a script once on uh, young Andy Jackson for a television show, and it was eviscerated as most of them were. But in the original script, I had young Andy Jackson at nine during the Revolutionary War leading a charge of young boys his own age through a cornfield and whacking at the corn and whacking at the corn and the adults were saying you you know scamp get you know get away from there because you're you're ruining the corn the food and he was pretending he was george washington because he wanted to get into the war so bad and andy jackson managed to get into the war at 14. it drug on long enough that he became uh, at 13 or 14 he got into the war because he was a patriot even at that time your i guess your formative years you stay what you uh, you were digging for, and uh, so I really humanized these characters because I thought if I were Andy Jackson, you know, it's I, I'm I am every leading character I guess that I write about, and uh, research-wise I do. I did a some prison stories in New York, and I became a great friend with Arch Sailor, who is the uh, chief probationary officer for the entire East Coast, and I met through him uh, a series of uh, guys who were in that type of work. They were all like Dick Tracy. I was so impressed. And I, I would get so hung up on the research, you know, just meeting the people and uh, reading, that uh, I have uh, great retention in areas. So I become kind of a Western lore expert. And uh, in various other areas, too, I've managed to hang into things. And I can uh, translate them very well, I think, because I uh, like to say this, this power of projection, I really feel I have, you know. But how much uh, knowledge of the medium, of the technical knowledge of the medium was required for you to write uh, scripts? None for me. I just ignored all that. I went to the Did library. Somebody else worry about that. I went to the library and I got some, uh, some movie scripts written by John Steinbeck. And I read those and I said, I got it. And I went back and started writing, you know. Uh, did you slant some of your scripts uh, to, uh, toward a certain actor, his personality, or his particular No, I never did that, because like I say, I'm always that guy. I'm always the... This uh, wasn't required of you? Well, when I wrote 20 Gunsmokes, for example, or 20 That's what I was getting, Jim, James Arnest. Jim Arnest. Well, I met Jim Arnest, of course, and knew him. And you have to uh, adhere to the format of the show. But that's very simple, and I tried to, I tried to work against it in most instances and uh, humanize Matt Dillon because he's become such a legend and the producers of the show because producers uh, we've talked before are uh, they're not my favorite kind of people because they're kind of I don't know it's 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 very weird they uh, they get into some strange some strange some strange thought patterns they thought that Jim Arness would refuse to do things that that humanized him and I would implore them to to try it on him and Jim is an actor and he loved it he would do things. I wrote the first gun smoke in which uh, Matt Dillon puts his arms around Miss Kitty. And uh, they were, they couldn't work, couldn't work. But he did it. 
you know, because it was well motivated yeah. and it gave him something to do. Who has the muscle in a TV production? Meaning most right. power, you know. Well, the networks, of course, you know. More so than, say, the producers? Oh, well, sure, the producers. The networks, uh, since the show has aired over their, uh, their facilities. Has that changed any recently, Clyde? No, I don't think so. No, the, the networks seem to be the, uh, the all-powerful element. I know a few years ago the uh, sponsors seem to to be uh, kind of in the saddle, yes. but then all of a sudden that kind of changed. I don't know why, maybe they became uh, a, a, a plethora of sponsors and not enough network time because uh, the network executives, they rule the, uh, the hours, you know, with a pretty iron hand and uh, I guess rightfully so because they seem to know what, what should be programmed where, but of course all of show business is uh, just one huge uh, cacophony of uh, errors, you know, like Jack Warner said, Clark Gable, you're, with those ears, you'll never make it, and he goes over to uh, MGM and the rest is history. And uh, so it's, it's very difficult, of course, to, to second guess anything. And the networks, uh, one network will, will uh, not accept a show like All in the Family, Carol O'Connor show, another one will, and kadoom, you know, so... Uh, You'd think that when things like that would happen, the people who turn those down, you'd think, boy, they're going to get the axe. It doesn't happen that way, weirdly so. You know, they, they, uh, they just keep going along, and it's very strange. Yes. You decided to go into film production, set up your own company. Which area of film production? You produce, write, and direct. Right. Do you have, is there one area, one of those three, that you feel a little more... Powerful with, a little more secure with? Well, as far as security, uh, I am totally secure in every area, which is an egotistical statement if you ever heard one, but it's not that difficult. That's what I learned. I learned that uh, writing to me is always the most important element of any dramatic presentation, and I think that's just a foregone conclusion. And uh, the writing is having as the basic structure of writing, then when you go to directing and producing, the producing is in essence raising the money. Now that's a very definite talent in itself, um, a talent of which I'm sadly lacking because I can't raise that much money. I don't have the, the friends with the money, and uh, I don't. I, I I can't lie to people. You know, I tell the people in my company always tell the truth. Then you got nothing to remember, and there's too many problems in this business to worry about that. So I always tell the truth, and uh, that can be a, a that's disadvantage. That's quite detrimental <laughs> because you're not you know you're not winging and sailing and selling people bills of goods. Because I tell them, you know, show business is a terribly risky thing. I can do a picture, however, for so little money that I think we're going to make money. And they say, how much can I tell them, 10, 20 times as much? And I say, no, I can't say that. I'm not going to make any projection at all because it would be just that, you know, fantasy. But uh, the writing, I'm, uh, that's the most important element to me. The directing, uh, the directors in Hollywood have gained control, and they have for a long time because I think simply because their area is the least concrete of the whole thing. I mean, like, uh, with, the, with a script and with your actors in front of it and with the money to do it, you can make a film. Uh, you can't make it without the actors. You can't make it without a script. You can't make it without the money. You can make it without the director because your writer is a man of an average intellect, hopefully. So are your actors. And so you can, you can literally say, hey, uh, Martin or Joe, uh, why don't you walk over there when you say that line? And the actor can say, yeah, I think I will. You know what I mean? So the director can enhance that you know, with very creative thinking. But he's in, on the scale of uh, importance. You know, if there has to be a scale, I, I don't place a director here where he's placed, number one. I put him down here, uh, <laughs> and I'm a director. You know? <laughs> and I put him way down the scale there somewhere because there are a lot of important people in filmmaking, and the uh, director can be, you know, a terrifically creative uh, additive factor to a production, but uh, the picture can get made without him, and it cannot without certain of the other elements. I want to talk a little bit about your two novels. What, mm -hmm. um, what was the, what prompted you to write The Innocents? This was your first novel. It was published back in 69, wasn't right. it? Right, in fall 69. Was there a um, particular incident that inspired the there was. Uh, Story? Uh, I had a little girl at that time, two years old, and Lee is going on six now, and uh, we had two huge dogs, a German Shepherd and a uh, Samoyed, which is a white husky, and they used to practically kill each other, and I finally had to get rid of one of them to the Air Force, and the other one I put on a farm, 
and uh, at this point they were two years old like she was, three years old, they were a little older than her, and they would play and romp and fight, and she would get right in the middle of them, and they would draw blood on each other before I could get to them, and they'd never touched this little girl of mine, because they loved her. She could take food out of their mouths, literally. She was, uh, it was a fantastically beautiful thing to watch. So I, I, the story leaped into my head, and I was into the gun smoke thing. I had to do six or seven scripts that year, so I went to Gunsmoke with the idea. They flipped for it and uh, started writing a Gunsmoke script. And, uh, of course, because of their limited uh, budget and uh, they only shoot the picture in six days, they could only have two days of exteriors. So they said, we'll have to closet it in. We'll have to put it in an outhouse shack of some kind, part of the action. And I said, something told me, ding, ding, ding. And so I said, let me do another script. So I gave him another script. I thought this was more important. And it ended up the novel, my first novel, which is, of course, you know, is a big, big step for a writer. Yes. And Did you write this in Europe? No, it was this right before I went to Europe. I see. Right How much time elapsed between The Innocents and The Eden Tree? Oh, uh, a year, year and a half, I guess. Now, The Eden Tree, though, was in written Europe. while you were in Europe. In France, right. How long did you stay in, uh, in France? It's a year. In France, a year. And were you spending most of that time on The Eden I, Tree? I, yeah. <coughs> I'm, I'm really a very prolific writer, Vanel. I write a lot. I write uh, at least Different three, projects going at the same at time? At the same time, sometimes three projects. And in Europe, I had the freedom of... Uh, I'd made a lot of money in television, and I wanted to go on to other areas, and I didn't have a publication date on The Innocence yet. And uh, so I wanted to, to branch out to expand, so I took a lot of the money I'd made in television, went to Europe, had a fantastic year living on the Riviera, and it was a great productive year for me because I would work in the morning, take off, work in the afternoon, take off, work at night, late into the night, and I would have two or three projects going at the same time, movie script, uh, novel, play, and yeah. I did a tremendous amount of work that year. Clyde, Eden Tree seems to be very autobiographical. Seems to be. Seems to be. Now, um, <laughs> could you have written this novel in, in this country? Could you have written in West Virginia? Was it necessary to go to the Riviera to no, be that no, far I removed? No, no, I could have written it anywhere because, you know, like I say, when you're a professional writer, you, you write. And I could have written it anywhere, but you get under the pressures of Hollywood, the television thing, you get into that and you've, uh, it's hard to get out of that. I did write The Innocents at the same time I was writing television. I'd write television in the morning take off a couple of three hours, come back and spend three or four hours on The Innocents during the day. That was right before I went to Europe. And I finished that. And uh, I could, could have conceivably have done the... But The Eden Tree was too important a book to try like that. So. The style is so <coughs> vastly different from The Innocents. The Innocents right. seemed to me that it's understandable how you could come home from uh, working on a right. television script and, and jump right into The Innocents. Right. But The Eden Tree is so... Yeah. Well, it's so vastly different that right. uh, it seems to me that you'd have to be in entirely different gear. I, that's what I had that. to do. I had to go there and take that time and, uh, I guess, replenish myself, you know, and I did. And once I got to writing The Eden Tree, I, uh, I, I needed some respite from that, too. You know, so I would go in, I'd write a comedy play or a picture at the same time, yes. you know. How personal is The Eden Tree? Well, it's really, uh, it's right on, kind of, you know, my, uh, my life or my concept of what life is and uh, means in terms of, of people, you know, myself and uh, my father and uh, a lot of people that we know, and I hope that a lot of people who read it, uh, you know, are, are, uh, are uh, understanding. What kind of, of reaction do you expect from... Uh, well, I, I shudder to think because it's... Uh, I don't really mean to be uh, bad to anybody in the book, really, except to myself, maybe. If I, but uh, but uh, but it's hard to tell because you know everybody sees someone else a certain way, and uh, I see some friends and family a certain way, and, and they may not like the way I see them. I I uh, I love them all, you know, but. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. Did you actually drive from Sistersville when you were that yeah, young? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. You got the car back to West Union? I did. First time ever Incredibly. driving? Incredibly. First time ever, you know. And my brothers were panic-stricken. They all remember it. this very vividly because I had one watching one side of the road and the other one watching the other. And I couldn't find the light switch because I'd never driven a car and I had to get home before dark. So I had to barrel over the roads. And you, if you've ever been to Sistersville, 
between Sisterville mm -hmm. and West Union, the roads, you can reach out and wipe your, your, uh, your, your tail light, you know, going around some of those uh, curves. But we made it, and it was an incredible circumstance. Now, you changed the names, obviously. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Slightly. Slightly. And in some cases, not, not very much, not, it seems to no, me. Not very much. And I, some names I didn't change at all, because yeah. uh, it's uh, kind of a tribute, I guess, it's to people. And, uh, Why did you choose the style that you did? A style that, in some cases, the entire section, it's not chapters, but in sections, right. the entire section would be one long sentence with no punctuation. Well, I've never talked about this before, but uh, it's, I guess, because it was so meaningful to me that, uh, that I just couldn't, I couldn't, uh, it's almost like, I guess, that I wasn't writing this somehow, you know? And uh, so, but if I did it in a formal style, like I did The Innocence and like I've done so many other works, and in television, you have to be very formalized, you know, you've got 53 minutes to fill up, you've got to fit it. But on The Eden Tree, since it was, uh, so personal to me and so meaningful, I guess I just couldn't bring myself to uh, say chapter one, you know. In other words, it came forth very freely and very right. honestly. Right. And it certainly gives that impression. And it's uh, maybe a little difficult for some people to read, but I, I'm really happy that I got it out. How much rewriting did you do on the Eden Tree? Well, very little. You know, I don't, in fact, I don't, very, I don't rewrite much at all. I'm. Uh, I'm a first draft writer, which uh, can be good or bad, I guess. Like Fitzgerald, my idol, he was a consummate, art articulate master. You know, he went over his work and would labor over a paragraph, and I admire that in him tremendously. But I can't do it somehow. There's something in me that just impels me on, you know, onto other things, onto other works, and I, I just hope that I'm getting the best that I've got on the first shot because. Uh, I'm kind of an untrammeled writer, I guess you would say. And I do it in television, too. I don't rewrite either there. No. Unless it's absolutely required. And well, and then I don't even do it. And somebody else? Uh, well, no, I do it, but uh, <laughs> I don't do it the way they want, yeah. which uh, that's amazing. They keep hiring me, frankly, but I, I am a good writer, really. And, and uh, so they, uh, they keep hiring me because they like the quality of the work, even though I'm very difficult over rewrites and changes. You know. This is a rather difficult question, Clyde, but what do you consider your greatest strength as a writer? Well, I don't, uh, I, I really don't know. The, I guess my, uh, I guess my security as a writer, I'm never afraid of the typewriter. And, uh, and I'll, because I've made pictures now for the last year, more over a year, I've been involved in making films and all the areas, I can't write much. But uh, when I do have to write, I just sit down at the typewriter, and uh, I have no fear of it at all. And I know some writers who are older, and they se fear seems to be the thing that, that stifles. Well, I can stifle anything, as mm -hmm. you know, so I'm sure that's probably my greatest strength as a writer, is I'm not afraid, you know. Has your birthplace affected your writing in any way? Sure, it's all, it's in every, everything, really. The Eden Tree encompasses it all, but I've written probably a dozen properties from incidents from the Eden Tree. You know, and uh, it's all kind of meshed in together. Thank you, Klein. We look forward to reading more of your novels, seeing more of your scripts on television, perhaps, thank but you. definitely seeing more of your films. Well, thank you, Donnell. I hope so. program was a WWVU-TV Cutter production.